I haven't done one of these in a while and my plan is to cover everything. So I'm gonna to try to knock out a lot more of these spotlight issues this year, time permitting. Today, we're gonna to look at the spotlight sound wave. This was written by Simon Furman and art by Marcelo Matier. Forgive me on pronunciations, but what am I, a linguist? Let's get into it. So this story is a bit of a flashback and takes place in our famous year of 1984. And a lot of the seeds that are laid here come to pay out a lot later on. And one of those seeds is Megatron and Bludgeon's relationship and how it is revealed that Bludgeon was assigned by Megatron to investigate Shockwave's research, which ties Bludgeon to Shockwave, and all of this eventually pays out in Dark Cybertron. But it's some of the groundwork for those relationships. And at this time, Bludgeon is still not really trusted by Megatron. So Megatron, who in IDW is known to have contingency plans on top of his contingency plans, not unlike Prowl, and not unlike a certain other caped cowed hero that I'm a big fan of. But the Regenesis project is discovered by Soundwave, which if we remember back to the Shockwave spotlight I did not too long ago, was all a part of Shockwave's plan to basically plant Energon inside of planets so that he could reap the benefits of them later on as he saw fit. This is also laying some seeds of deceit for Bludgeon who never reports this information directly to Megatron. Kind of keeps it as his little secret. However, neither does Soundwave and we'll circle back to this later. But this is an issue that I have with this book. Now, it turns out Soundwave has been watching Bludgeon for some time and does notice something that they secure on Cybertron to hide before leaving for Earth. And Soundwave, of course, does follow them to Earth to continue observations. Just as a side note, Iguanas and Bomb Burst are both working for Bludgeon. And I did dig how they were like both pretenders and it kind of tied all that pretender element together in terms of them working. When Soundwave reaches Earth, he takes on the tape deck mode and ends up with some construction workers by plan in order to kind of oversee Bludgeon's actions. And while watching, you find out that two humans that are there, Fleming and Markham, are actually called facsimiles, which are basically not really real and it gets a little goofy and we I don't want to fall into the woods on that but for all intents and purposes you can think of them as kind of copies of imitations but what you ultimately learn is that they have discovered ultra energon below the construction site which is all part of the regenesis program while reporting this they're actually being tracked by ravage and laser beak which is how Soundwave learns that the plot is really to blow up the construction site in order to get the ultra energon from underneath Soundwave lets that plan run to fruition and has laser Laser Beak take him to the Bludgeon base, which takes place inside Mount St. Helens, and waits for them to kind of return with their spoils. But they return by a teleportation device called a Orbital Bounce, which apparently causes them to be slightly disoriented after each use. Soundwave uses that as sort of an element of surprise to make himself known. And while the pretenders are pretty much ready to go to war, Soundwave informs them that that's not his intention, and what his intention actually is, is to wet his beak on the Energon that Bludgeon's team has just took. In Bludgeon's turn, Terms, he basically wants a cut. And this bothers me. It bothers me because to me, Soundwave is the ever loyal Decepticon. Tying back into some of the stuff he never reported to Megatron, this is one of the issues I had with Soundwave in these earlier books because it didn't seem true to the spirit of the character that I know. But the story continues. And Bludgeon informs Soundwave that it's really not about the bottom line for him, that he has much bigger plans that aren't really motivated so much by power, but to resurrect Thunderwing. That basically they initially were driven by power, but after they found Thunderwing's remains, the main objective became to bring him back as what seems to be a true leader. And due to the events of Stormbringer, which I do hope to get into at one point, where basically Thunderwing, as Soundwave says, came close to destroying them all, Soundwave can't let this fly. The battle ensues. Laserbeak and Ravage are kind of quickly taken out by Bludgeon, which makes sense. But before he does, they were able to take out Iguanus and Bomb Burst. But in a twist of fate, Iguanus is able to recover and grabs a weapon that Shockwave has been working working on from his quote-unquote experimental weaponry, pulls the trigger on Soundwave, which forces him back into tape deck mode. At this point, Bludgeon says he imagines that it's a considerable inconvenience, but that Soundwave won't have much time to reflect on his predicament before dropping some sort of depth charge into the lava below, causing an explosion as he uses the orbital bounce again to get out in the nick of time. The explosion occurs, buries Soundwave, laser beak, and ravage in a pile of lava and rock and mountain, etc., etc., where they remain for a year year before being found by Skywatch, who find Laserbeak and Ravage presumably in full beast mode, so to speak, but Soundwave in tape mode, who we find out by 
2007 ends up in a pawn shop or a vintage shop kind of waiting to be reactivated. And that's how the story ends. It's short, it's tight, it's concise. It lays the seeds for some things they develop later on. A worthwhile read, but I will say that one characterization of Soundwave not being 100% loyal does bother me. As always, if you're interested, I recommend you pick these up in the IDW Collection hardcover books. Some of them are a little hard to track down at this point, but they have a display presence and they're well put together. And I hope to do more in the future. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Until next time, take care.